What up, y'all? Welcome back to Extra Notes Academy. You already know, God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does, you feel? I say you go, that extra note. But this is a uh, reaction video to uh, a beloved brother in the faith. So I was, you know, making comments on social media about the passage, 1 Peter 3, 2021, 20, which says that baptism now saves you. And I'm arguing from the scriptures what that means, what it does not mean, and how basically baptism is a gift to us from God. So somebody in the comment section was trying to do their due diligence. So they did their Googles and they found out that their favorite preacher, pastor, teacher understands this text in a different way. And they sought to, I guess, send it to me, not as a challenge, maybe as a challenge, but really just, I guess, probably to dialogue with this person. So this is my chance to react to that video for them in particular and for you as you're tapping in right now. So the person is John Piper, but I want to say this. Um, I, I certainly value John Piper. He's my brother in the Lord. And many nights and many seasons of my life, the Lord has used him to strengthen and encourage me. Um, he said words that have lifted me out of dark places um, and pointed me towards the Lord and the scriptures. So I honor him. I value him as my family in Christ. So this is not a shot at my brother, but I do disagree with his position here. So I just want to unpack that and just spend some time doing that. So yeah, we're going to get into that. I got my Brody Cortez, Vivid Cortez on deck. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. <laughs> we in here. Facts. So we're going to chop it up. And uh, so hopefully you find this beneficial. Enough talking. Let's get into it. In this session of Look at the Book on 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22, we're going to ask the question, how baptism saves you? Because for many, in some traditions, that's a very startling statement. And the question is going to be answered by attending very carefully to the immediate qualifying context that Peter gives in the statements, not as a removal of dirt from the body and so on. What I did want to say, though, is uh, it is a startling statement when it's closed to you. You feel me? So when it's, um, when it's a statement out there that's disconnected from the clarity of Scripture, the continuity of what God is doing, the statement is... It can sound startling to use his words, but understood rightly, um, it's a beautiful reality. You know what I mean? So I just want to add that piece to the conversation. <laughs> let's keep it going. So let's read it. Baptism, which corresponds to this, we'll look at that, namely the rescue from the flood back in the days of Noah. Baptism, which corresponds to this rescue through the flood, now saves you like God saved Noah and his family, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience or from a good conscience, different translations, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Father, you are very great, and your Son has been brought to your right hand in the Lordship of the universe over all demonic power and over death. And I pray that we would see that here in such clear and beautiful and powerful light that our confidence in you and our boldness for you in this world would be increased. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Baptism, which corresponds to this. He had just said that uh, in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So a few people in a world of unrighteousness were rescued by God and brought safely through water. And that triggers in Peter's mind that this is a 
type, we might call it, or a foreshadowing, or a preview, or a pointer to baptism. Now, I like, I like that. I like that so far, he's rightly associating the fact that Noah and his family, the eight, were saved through water. So keep that in mind. And Noah and his family were really saved through water. They weren't metaphorically saved through water. They weren't symbolically saved through water. And the interesting thing, too, is oftentimes people try to say, no, nah, they were saved through the ark. They weren't saved through the water. But the scripture says that they were saved through the water because of the thing that Piper is admitting and confessing here is that this is a, 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 a type of, of or a foreshadowing towards baptism. That's the point. So Peter, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, is making this connection. You feel me? So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. So I did want to add. Yeah, turn up. I did want to add that uh, we have to notice that it, God saved Noah through a physical water, not a, like you said, metaphorical water, yeah. not a symbolic water, but actual physical water. That's right. And that's important because we have to remember what baptism is. Because there are some who would like to remove real water. <laughs> Not as real, bro. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Now, what does that mean, that baptism saves you? And if you isolated that away from its context, you could go into all kinds of heretical notions and say, well, it's the water that saves, or it's the priestly application of the water. That's the sacramental effectiveness of grace, which takes away sin, regardless of whether there's faith or not, or anything like that. You could go in those directions, but look, baptism saves you, and then he, as if listening in on our doubts and conversations, he says, no, not, not as a removal of dirt from the body. Okay, now this is important too, because what you should observe is he has a primary um, bad guy in a room, if you will. He has, he has a primary person or theology or thought in mind that he's deemed as the, um, the thing to fight against. So as he's working through this text, he's working with two things in a room the Baptist understanding and this other understanding that places emphasis on mere water or places emphasis on just the physical act of baptism apart from faith, having the ability to save. So that's his enemy. That's the, that's the bad guy in the room that he's fighting against. And it's important to note that that's not the Lutheran position. That's not what we're arguing. So he doesn't have in the room all of the um, contributions of thought as it relates to what the Holy Spirit is getting at through Peter's words. So I want to point that out because he has one enemy in the room and that's going to be what he's going to contend or to fight against. And unfortunately, that's going to leave uh, missing pieces to what Peter is actually communicating in his text. Keep that in mind. Now, he could have followed that by, but as a removal of sin from the soul. So it sounds like, well, maybe he's, he's saying it is the water and the baptism which saves you effectively, but it, the effect of the water going over your body is not to take away the dirt of the body, it's to take away the sin of the soul. And that's not what he says. He, he doesn't go in that direction. Now, this is tricky right here. So his understanding of baptism, obviously as a Baptist, is that it's a symbol. The enemy in the room is that it's mere water only. So we, we don't have the biblical definition of baptism in the room yet. Baptism is not mere water, nor is it a symbol. Baptism is God's word 
wedded or tied to the water. Matter of fact, let me show you and read to you this passage. So this is Ephesians 5, so you can know where I'm getting this from. So if you go to Ephesians 5, where Paul is breaking this down, he says, Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church, that he might sanctify her, that's the church, having cleansed her, the church, by the washing of water with the word. That's baptism, the water and the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So Paul is communicating here that the way God is presenting a church holy and without blemish is through this washing of water with the word. That's how the church understands baptism. So that clarifying statement of what baptism is, is not in a room, right? So he's only dealing with baptism either as a symbol or this other understanding that's just um, focused on mere water, like some type of holy water. That's not what Peter is saying. So that's why he's saying this statement, not as a removal of dirt from the body. He's saying it would have been helpful if Peter was saying, but baptism is a removal of sin from the soul. So in his mind, he's saying Peter did not say that. But in fact, he is saying that. That's why he says baptism, which corresponds to this, Noah and his situation, where God saved them and his family, right? The eight, through water, real water, they were really saved. Everybody else died, they lived. So he really saved them. And then he says, so baptism corresponds to that, which Piper admits. There's this foreshadowing from then to what baptism would be. So Piper rightly connected that to baptism. Then he says that it now saves you, not as a removal of dirt. So, so Peter is saying that baptism saves you. He is saying that. Piper here is saying that it's not a removal of dirt. And he's taking that statement to say, therefore, baptism doesn't save you because it doesn't remove dirt from the body. To which we would say, that's the point. It doesn't simply just wash dirt off your body. It's not some external ritual. That's not what it's doing. Because the problem isn't that we're physically dirty. It's not like God is saying, I can't save you because your body's dirty. That's not even the, the narrative on a table. So that's why Peter is saying it's not that. The problem isn't that we're physically dirty. So baptism isn't just washing us because we're physically dirty. He's saying something else is taking place, which is salvation. And that's what's getting lost on Piper because he only has that symbolic view. And the enemy in the room in his mind is only this one other option, which is hyper focused on mere water, some kind of holy water. Yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> the dangerous thing or think something that I, I, I think I noticed um, when watching this this part specifically it, to me, it seems like he's already approaching the text, like you said, with something else in his mind, like a preconceived notion, which is always dangerous when you approaching a text, because if you if you putting something into it, you're not getting what the Lord is giving you out of it. Big you know what I'm saying? Big so facts. you're putting your own thoughts into it, and I think that that's dangerous in some cases. Yeah, that's important because, like you're saying, he he already has an enemy. So it sort of clouds you from just seeing what's there. What's there? And yeah, you gotta you're fighting against this this other idea in the room. And yes, it, it's hard to just see what the words are saying. I love that, bro. Big facts. He says, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, or some translations say, as a response to God from a good conscience. Either In either case, what's being focused on here is not how the water is effective, but rather what the baptism th through water signifies and what it... Now, that's, that's sneaky. So he just slipped into the text this idea that's not in a text. So he just slipped in 
um, that, that baptism signifies something. But if we're honest, without going further, is there anything in this wording that talks about a signal or something signifying? Everything is very blatant. Everything is very clear. These are strong statements. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. At this point, does anything signal to you that, there, that there's uh, some type of metaphor here that's, that, that can't be made? The problem would be you reading into the word baptism something else. So that's the important question. What is baptism? That's it. it. Signifies is an act of the heart, an appeal to God or a response to God. So, so the, the, the baptismal act is expressing an act of the soul that is praying. It's looking to God for God to cleanse the conscience or from a good conscience for God to save the soul in some other uh, expression, that is, through the forgiveness of sins. or It could have gone in any one of, of several directions for how God is going to do it. All that he's focusing on here is that the act of baptism is not being thought of as water doing its work but rather water representing an act of faith from the soul that does its work. In other words, the, the instrument of salvation is not the water, not the water, but we could say faith, that is the, the, the response of the soul expressing itself in a prayer to or a response to God. Ooh, this is this is sort of scary. Now, because I know Piper, I know in a trillion years he would never say um, that we're saved by works. He would he would he would rightly assert that we're justified by faith alone. He would acknowledge also that that faith is a gift. So I know his intention is not to say. What I would argue he's accidentally saying here. So what he's saying is baptism is an instrument, right? It's a, it's a, a tool, an appeal to God. It's an expression of faith from us. It's an action from us. He even says that it's a prayer from us. He says that that transaction on our part is what, gets the credit or plays a part in our salvation. Now that's sneaky and tricky because he's putting much more weight on our response to being saved. And I, and I know my brother wouldn't want to be communicating that, but because he's, you know, respectfully from the Reformed Baptist tradition, he's Baptistic in his thinking about baptism, that he's, he's adding this activity on our part to what it means to be saved because the text says baptism now saves you so if baptism saves you and for him baptism is an instrument it's a prayer from us to god it's an action that we do that is an appeal to god he has god responding to us in our effort to save us and that's not the biblical message. The biblical message is that there's nothing we can do. There's no amount of belief on our own that we can strum up within ourselves. There's no sincere enough of a prayer that we can offer to God to get ourselves saved. There's no action that we can perform to symbolically represent how serious we are before God that he would notice and then say, all right, I see that you being 100 percent authentic about it. I'm going to go ahead and bring you in. We know that that cannot happen because Paul says in Romans 3, no one seeks God. We're all, we're all, no one is um, looking for God. We're dead in our sin. We don't have the ability. We don't have enough life in us to, to, uh, to approach God or to acquire about him even. We are dead. How does a dead person respond? They don't because they dead. 
So because he's upholding the symbolic view, he's adding, unfortunately, these ideas into baptism that he has God responding to to save us. Now, he's going to do a move. You'll, you'll see he's going to do a move because he's going to sort of catch himself and know I can't have God responding to us. But the gridlock is the misunderstanding of what baptism is, which is word and water. And it's God doing the work. Baptism is God's work, not ours. Continue to listen. You will hear from Piper's rhetoric that he has baptism being our work that God is responding to. Keep that in mind. And then he clarifies further how the baptism saves. He says it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I think the point there is that he has in mind that baptism, I'm looking at Romans 6, 4, the picture of baptism as you go into the water is we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism. I got to stop it again. I'm doing a lot of stops, but these are important. So he just added to this text that baptism is a picture. What in this text says that baptism is a picture? It says we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism. Nothing in this text signifies that baptism isn't real water, that baptism is a metaphor or that it's a picture or it's a symbol. This text simply uses the word baptism. So what it forces you to do as a Baptist is to read into the text a symbol, a metaphor into the word baptism. But nothing in this text says that baptism is not real water. And the only reason he's fighting against water is because he has an enemy in a room. He has one enemy in a room, which is people that make a holy water. But the crazy thing that I was thinking about is like, um, we've always been taught that like, um, like baptism. Uh, so one thing that I do know is like Baptists for sure see baptism as full immersion, right? So how then does Piper go and make this a symbol or, or non, uh, even full immersion baptism, when it says baptism, you can't take what we define baptism is out of this text. Brilliant, bro. That's brilliant because valued in the Baptist tradition is full immersion in real water. In real water. So, so Baptists wouldn't argue that when they baptize on a Sunday morning that you should use no water. Yeah. They, would, they would enforce that there be water. And they would also enforce that you go fully under. I love that. That's a great point. And uh, so now here in this text, all of a sudden, you're removing real water. You know, and that's why I said on the song, I said, how you fighting over that the proper mode is to immerse a person into real water, but your hermeneutic is dehydrated and you violating what the spirit taught us. So right here you have this dehydrated baptism where there's no water. But Paul didn't say that. He says, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. So Paul is saying, this is what happens when you're baptized. And the important thing to understand here is that baptism is God's work. We can't bury ourselves into death. You know what I'm saying? Um, he says, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, um, who too, that you might walk in news of life. We can't raise ourselves from the dead. This is God's work. It's God who buries us. It's God who raises us to life like he did Christ. So baptism is not something we do. It's something that God does to us, though he uses physical means like he always does. Water, the pastor, you feel me? But to read and take out real water here or to make this a symbol is definitely reading into the text. I don't want to make this too long, but I do want to say I, I do remember being baptized and hearing or being told um, in this baptism, you're buried with Christ and you're raised into the newness of salvation. And it's like, OK, if that's what I'm being told, how then does Piper go and say, you know, what he said right there? Yeah, like that taking, it's a picture. Taking, taking the, the, liter the literalness out of this and making it a symbol. Facts. Yeah, it's, it's sort of picking and choosing 
because your priority is to uphold a symbolic view. So you have to sometimes make it real water, sometimes make it not. And that's that's what you cannot do when you're when you're studying and reading the scriptures. Good point, bro. Into death, in order that justice Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So, so the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the act by which we are saved from the death which baptism signifies. But see, he, he, he keeps adding that signifies in there. What, but the scripture is saying that baptism is doing this. So he's selectively removing pieces of the text out. Like it doesn't say that this is a picture, that it signifies that. It says we were buried therefore with him by it. It says by it we were buried. It don't say that by it we picture or by it we signal that. By it is literal. It's literal. By baptism. This is doing that through Jesus. So I just find it interesting that um, you have to start playing fast and loose with these definitions to uphold your view. So it seems like the priority is your systematic view or your ex interpretation as opposed to the plain meaning. That's, that's the unfortunate part. So when he says here, baptism by being an appeal to God or an act of faith of the soul that rests in God's cleansing power, baptism saves us through the resurrection. He means in this act, we are united to Christ so that his resurrection saves us from death. It's not the waters of Noah that are threatening us. It's death that is threatening us. And therefore, it's through the resurrection that we come through death into newness of life and into resurrection life. And and if that were not enough, that the enemy of... You got some in you, bro. Yeah, bro. That, that just make it seem like... I feel like he's complicating it more than than even this scripture is is saying. I get it. I, I agree because so what he's doing, he's like, it's not, what do you say? It's not Noah's waters that are threatening us. But in fact, that's the connection that Peter is making. So you have to keep Noah's situation in mind because he says baptism, which corresponds to this, talking about Noah. So he wants you to hold Noah in this family scenario in your brain. Right. So in your brain, what was at stake? Life or death, life or death, life or death. Keep that in mind, Peter's saying, because baptism corresponds to life or death, life or death, life or death. So baptism now saves you just like Noah and his family were saved. So he's removing now the story of Noah from the text and wants to put the focus on the appeal and the resurrection. And the appeal, he's arguing, is our action, our prayer that, that we offer to God that he sort of responds to and, and grants salvation. So he's removing this important part of the narrative, which is it is life or death that Noah and his family underwent, but were saved through water. And just like that, what's at stake here is life or death. And what he's doing is using baptism as an instrument to save us, to deliver salvation, to deliver forgiveness of sins. That's Peter's point. He's removing that from um, this text because he wants to focus on the resurrection and the threat of death. He wants to remove the sacramental reality, not as understood by those who have water at the forefront. So he's only fighting one enemy, and that's where he's, he's getting stuck at. But I like what you're saying. He's, it's complicating the the simple read of the text yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely adding so many layers to it it's, it's getting kind of confusing actually it, 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 that's what i was saying it's, it's kind of confusing me um because like i think the perfect um mirroring uh scripture is the one that he pointed out um to what this scripture is saying but it's like it's like he's muddying the waters on both scriptures to make them read something that is not really saying. Yeah. 
I agree, bro. Respectfully, that's the that's the that's the bro. But I, I respectfully agree, bro. It's uh, it's adding too many layers of confusion to it to what's simply there. Death has been overcome. He continues to say, "This Christ, who was raised from the dead, this Christ has gone into heaven in his resurrection body, and is at the right hand of God, meaning." the sovereign of the universe, with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Meaning, you're not just saved from death, but you're saved now from all the demonic powers of the universe. If you picture the empty tomb here, looking back, death is overcome. And looking forward, these demons are overcome. When he died and rose, Death was conquered. Demons were conquered. Amen to the fact that through the resurrection is um, is the the what is enlivening these realities, right? Through the resurrection, Jesus has conquered all. All authority is given to him. Angels, demons, everything is under his feet, and. Peter's point, though, is that baptism is in power, enlivened through the resurrection. You see, he's removing baptism. Well, he doesn't have the right definition of baptism, I would argue, but he's trying to remove it out of the picture and hyper focus on the appeal and the resurrection. Uh, and he, so he's, he's trying to exclude sort of this sacramental reality and the problem is, but it's in the text, though. So you can't cut and edit and take out the statement baptism, which corresponds to a saving that happened before, really, is saving you now. He's trying to remove that narrative out and just focus on the Baptist message, which is you hear the gospel, you get convicted of sin, you trust God, you receive the benefits of salvation. He wants to keep it in that way of understanding salvation. Problem is, the text has brought this other sacramental reality in, not water only, but water tied to the word of God, where you trust what God is doing through this means. He's removing that sacramental reality, rightly understood, and that's the, that's the problem. That's the problem, you feel me? When he died, and rose, death was conquered, demons were conquered. So let's just go back and review. He just said in 320 that back in Noah's day, a few people, that is eight, were brought safely through water. It looked like the whole world was arrayed against just a few Christians or a few believers back in that day and how helpless the family of Noah must have felt. And here are these Christians in the Roman Empire feeling that all of the empire seems so wicked and they seem so small and death is threatening and, and all the demonic powers are threatening. And Peter wants them to say, look, baptism similar to Noah being rescued, is the means by which you are rescued insofar as that baptism is an appeal to me, either from or for a good conscience, and by that appeal, by that act of faith. See, that's, that's sneaky. He put more weight on our act of faith. Woo! Be careful. I will come. And I will, in my resurrection, save you from death. And in my exaltation into heaven at the right hand of God, save you from all the demonic powers. You need not fear that you are such a, a small and seemingly insignificant group. You are mine. And I will save you. Yeah. So, you heard it. You heard it. You heard the, the, the sort of... Um, style of interpretation and how he's moving throughout the text and highlighting our action, our act of faith, putting the onus on us 
to have the quality of faith that God will respond to. You heard it. And you heard him put more um, verbiage in the word appeal. He used words like our prayer, our, our instrument. When we are baptized, it's an instrument, a picture that um, God is responding to. And he's doing something like he did with Noah. So that's not in the text. Peter didn't say baptism is something like what saved Noah and his family. No, Peter said baptism, which corresponds to this, the Noah situation, now saves you. That's very clear. What happened with Noah and his family? They were really saved through water, Peter says. He didn't bring up the ark. Though we know the narrative, Peter's making a different point because he's pointing, the Holy Spirit is, is allowing us to see the connection to baptism. And Piper rightly admitted that at the beginning. So that was good. So let us keep that in mind. A lot more can be said. We're going to do another part to this where we bring in my Lutheran brother, um, Brian Wolf Mueller. He's going to talk about the, the proper understanding of this text, I would argue. And uh, so hopefully you found this to be useful. Watch it again because there's a lot of pauses, but these are important pauses because we're trying to show you um, some of the ways in which this text has been complicated, as, as, as Cortez pointed out. And we're going to and hopefully you're seeing that all of these extra layers are being read into the text and things are being scooped out in order to preserve the symbolic view um, that just doesn't show up in this passage. But God, again, he's delivering grace to us through the means of water wedded or tied to his word. That's what baptism truly is based on Ephesians 5, 25 and other texts. So. Yeah, stay stay around, man. Let's get it.